Hi, and uh, welcome uh, to the Big Day of Giving with Headwaters Science Institute. I'm Meg Seifert. I'm the Executive Director of Headwaters. And I'm going to introduce to you, this is Alec Atkin. He is one of our board members at Headwaters. Thanks for joining us today, Alec. Um, so Headwaters Science Institute, for those of you that don't know, is a nonprofit um, with the mission of fostering curiosity through science. And this is super important to me uh, because I think that kids don't often have a chance to do um, what I call real science, which is going through that process of actually doing research and understanding what it means to um, create a question, test a hypothesis. Um, it's, it's just something that most people, unless you go to graduate school, don't really have a chance to do. You might be able to do something like, um, I don't know, do a lab in science class, but you already basically know the answer. So Headwaters tries to get kids a variety of science activities um, and other curriculum through our research projects. So they are using writing skills, critical and analytical thinking skills, and um, presenting skills. They end with a presentation. And we also teach statistics uh, to high school students. Um, I think it's super important, especially right now as the, in our current education environment's been changing, that we do what we can to get kids a great education. Um, so this year, uh, we have, we're doing the big day of giving again with the Sacramento uh, Community Foundation. Um, and um, it is uh, through, um, through this foundation that we today are trying to raise money. We have a $10,000 match and this money will be going to support our online programs as well as um, our school programs once we get back to a place that um, we, can, we can do this. Uh, today you can donate, it's bigdayofgiving.org backslash headwaters. Um, and I would like to, and so if you have a chance, please go on and help support us. It makes a big difference. This money um, allows us to do these programs and it allows us to give all kids a chance to get some uh, great science education. All of our online programs so far have, uh, have been free. Um, we, are, we are going to do an online summer camp. That one will have a uh, charge, but we're also raising scholarship money for it. So Alec, are you, uh, can you hear me now? Hello. Hi, Alec. Um, good to have you on. Um, I was hoping that you could talk about why the Headwaters uh, mission is important to you. I think Alex having a little trouble hearing me. Let me try something. Alex, were you able to hop back in? So, um, Headwater Science Institute. So, um, I really believe in the mission. Um, it's important for young um, kids. Um, elementary, middle school, high school, to learn about science and um, to learn about how science work and be curious. And in particular, Headwater Science Institute, there's a lot of involvement in actually going out to the field and touching and doing. And for kids um, to increase their curiosity and understanding of the world, this is really important. Um, I'd like to kind of um, talk about why, um, I, how I ended up joining Headwaters uh, Science Institute. So I have, um, I've known Meg for about 10 years. My kids uh, ski at the Auburn Ski Club where Meg was um, a director there. And um, 
so she had asked me to help coach with the kids. I did that. And then I ended up joining the Auburn Ski Club board for about three or four years. Um, and then one day I got a, an email from Headwater Science Institute, which I knew was uh, Meg's uh, organization and asking me to donate. And so I went and I checked in the Form 990 Foundation, which is an excellent place to see how nonprofits are using money. And um, I looked over their finances because I don't donate until I know that the nonprofit is actually using the money wisely. And what I saw was uh, an organization that had um, very low overhead. So that is, they don't spend a lot of money on unnecessary things. It's just money, the, sal the money is mostly going towards salary and their expenses to lay out their programs. And I thought, wow, this is a really good organization. One, she's got a mission that I can really appreciate. And the other is um, that she um, uses her money effectively. So I sent in a check. And next thing I know, I've got a little email from Meg asking me if she wanted to join the board. Um, and and uh, of course, I talked over my wife because it is a bit more time than out of the family, but she thought it was a really great uh, fit for me. And so um, I ended up uh, joining the board. Um, my background is um, I have a mechanical engineering degree from M MIT and an MBA from London Business School in England. Um, and also I've worked in Japan for six years. Um, I've been in a bunch of different sorts of industries, worked at HP for about 15, and now I'm currently at a behavioral health company in California, out in Sacramento. So that's a bit about myself. Thanks. Thanks, Alec. Um, that was great. Um, yes, I was so excited that Alec uh, chose to okay, join Okay, and so Meg, okay, thanks, Meg. I'm really excited that Alec was able to join our board and has been able to uh, give us just a lot um, of great advice and help uh, through his big business uh, background and his engineering background. Um, it's really brought a lot to Headwaters. So um, Alec, what live stream events are you most excited about today? Um, can you tell us about your plan viewing plans? Okay, so today we have two interactive science lessons where you can watch along and participate from home. The first is with board president Andy Giordano in just a little bit at 9 a.m. Andy gave a great talk on his science background last week, which you can find in our Facebook library. The second interactive lesson today is a live version of our weekly science challenge lesson with Mary Ellen. We started these lessons about six weeks ago and they've been a big hit. And today we're gonna to do the lesson live in nature. Another exciting part of today is you'll get to hear from a lot of people involved with what we do. Everyone from some of the school teachers we work with, and they'll be speaking at 2.30, to our grad student instructors like Daniel Dudek at 1 p.m. to more of our board members popping up throughout the day. And finally, at 4.30, we're streaming a happy hour party. In part, we want to do something to give back to our supporters, so we arrange a few special guests. Jenny and Jesse Dunn for the Dead Winter Carpenters are gonna play us a few songs. We are really, really grateful to them for stopping by. We'll also have our board members, Jack Holmes, sharing some cocktail recipes, and Craig Rowe will lead two rounds of trivia. You can follow along with us and we'll award prizes for correct answers. Plus, if you donate today and play trivia later, we'll give you five extra points. And back to you, Meg. Yeah, so um, with the uh, big dog, you just hop online again at the um, bigdayofgiving.org uh, slash headwaters, and um, you can go ahead and grab your five points uh, for towards the trivia, um, as well as help students get a great science um, education. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Alec. We've already had some great people who hopped on, um, some right after midnight last night to support us today uh, with their donations. And we would like to thank some of them live. So um, 
Alec, if you could uh, go ahead and do some thank yous. I'd like to thank uh, some of our donors who've come in early today. Um, without you, we really couldn't have this wonderful um, organization. We have Veronica Kendall from Savannah, Georgia, Stephen Blackmer from Canterbury, New Hampshire. We have an anonymous. We have Nick Pavlina from Capitol, California, Lynn and Allie Dunson from Big Flats, Wayne Johnson from Concord, New Hampshire, another anonymous, Lydia and Dirksa Dunson from South Paris, Maine, Carly Goodno from Lancaster, South Carolina, William Toscano from Lignier, Pennsylvania, Buff Went from Truckee, California, and of course our board president, Andy Girardano. And we'd like to, uh, we have a t-shirt, Headwater Sciences t-shirt that we are giving away as a special thank you. And that's going to Nick Pavlina of Capitola, California. Back to you, Meg. Yeah, congratulations, Nick. We are excited. We'll be having prizes throughout the day. Um, and we are excited to be able to go ahead and give away some t-shirts as well as some other prizes later on today. I'm gonna go ahead and let Alec uh, get back to work. Um, Thank you, Meg. It's been great talking. And goodbye. Yeah, bye. Thank you, Alec. Um, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, joining us and taking time out of his his busy work day um, to to join us. So right now, um, I hope that you guys hop on and donate. And I am going to bring in Spencer Usden, our program director, and we are going to talk about programs for a little bit and show you some photos. Um, from our programs as we wait until about, for about 20 minutes um, until Andy Giordano, our board president, um, can hop on. So welcome, Spencer. Good morning, Meg, how are you? I'm great, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It was great to see Alec and um, hear him say why he's so excited about Headwaters. You're wearing a great t-shirt today. Where'd you get that? Today is the shirt for, uh, this is the shirt for today. <laughs> Mine you can't see as well in the in the live stream. I'm too small, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a good shirt. You can pick up some of those at our website if uh, anyone's interested in sporting their own, or you can win one of these uh, through our big day of giving um, donations. So I am going to um, pop out for just a second, Spencer, and. Um, queue up that slideshow if you want to uh, mention a few things about why you like working with our programs. Um, yeah, as you uh, as you all watching at home will get to see in um, just a little bit um, through the photos of some of the programs that we're sharing, um, we get to do a lot of really great science um, with students outside. And I think probably my favorite part of teaching with Headwaters this is a pretty novel experience for a lot of the students that we get to work with. Um, many of them haven't had the chance to actually do open-ended science like Meg was saying, and that a lot of the questions that these students are trying to answer when they're doing their experiments, they don't have an idea as to what the answer will be. And neither do I as an instructor. We're kind of investigating something new or investigating something in a, a new type of habitat. And so we get to go out there, get dirty, get muddy, and do real science that um, there's a real sense of exploration in. Um, and so we've got today's awesome schedule that you can also find linked on our Facebook page here that can tell you when all of the, uh, all of the best events throughout the day are. Um, and it's pretty, um, it's pretty neat, um, especially at 4.30 today, we've got our happy hour, uh, like Meg said earlier, where we've got the Dead Winter Carpenters, Brian and Jesse Dunn coming along, um, as well as some really cool trivia. Our One of our other board members, Craig Rowe, um, is an excellent trivia host. I actually frequent his um, Monday trivia there. Um, and he does a really fun job of crafting questions that are entertaining, but also ones that we uh, um, you actually feel like you learned something too. Um, I helped him write a couple of the questions. And so um, there will be a few hints for today's, uh, the 
questions that you'll have this evening throughout the day as well. Um, sometimes if it's in full screen, it might be tricky. I don't know what the easiest way is. Um, Sorry, Spencer, I was just waiting for you to start. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to leave the schedule up because this is gonna start playing oh, on us. So, yeah. Um, that yeah. sounds great. And so I think Megan and I are gonna talk you through at home what some of these projects are. Um, and it should be pretty good. So let's see. Uh, this one was with the Forest Lake Christian School this fall where we studied bird behavior um, and the pond that they have just behind their school. Um, that was pretty neat. Yeah, um, so the slides are uh, moving through a little bit quickly and the Google show doesn't have a way for me to really slow them down, but I thought, you know, we can, we can talk about a few of the slides um, and just our programs in general. Yeah, the, I think this is out in the Northern Meadow with one of our AP environmental studies groups here. Um, you can see on the right, and it's a pretty, pretty fun program where we get to do a little bit more in-depth water quality um, measurements as well. Oh. And then- Yeah, I was actually just gonna go back because we missed um, this, which- Oh yeah, that's important. Yeah, so this summer, um, as things have been changing uh, dramatically and a lot of people's summer plans have been changing, we decided that it would be a great opportunity for students to be able to do some independent research. Um, and so we are gonna start signups, I think on Monday for this uh, summer program space is super limited. Um, so you uh, can hop on and uh, use that bit.ly link at the bottom to um, get prepared for us to uh, drop the uh, information about registering. But basically our goal for the summer is for students to do a research project and uh, be able to publish that at the end. Spencer is going to be the coordinator of this program. Do you have any thoughts or? Yeah, it, it's gonna be really fun because it's a little bit longer than some of our normal programs. And so we're gonna be able to go a bit more in depth into any one topic. Um, and then obviously, as you said, create this manuscript for publication. So this is gonna be very similar to the, the scientific um, process and um, peer review process that many people um, do when they submit journals in the graduate school and, and on up. Um, but uh, it's, it's gonna be a neat experience um, to really give some strong uh, independent students the opportunity to dive really deeply and then create a really cool polished end product that they can be proud to share um, through that publication or also um, on a college application as well. Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, and so while the kids won't get to be together um, as we typically do for our summer programs, uh, they will still get a really good opportunity to do research um, and learn something about the local environment around their house. Yeah. And the neat thing is you can create research on anything. So whether you're in a city or in some place with a little more natural space um, like Truckee here, there are tons of really neat things that you could create a science project around um, based on what you're interested in as a, as a student. Yeah, and um, here we can see some of the examples of projects that kids have done in the past. Obviously, these aren't gonna be the ones that everybody will be able to do this summer. Although if you live near some water or trees, um, you know, most of these opportunities will be there. We have some materials that uh, we can either send or recommend that, uh, you know, pretty inexpensive things that kids can purchase to help with their research. Yeah, that's one big thing with headwaters. It's a definite misnomer that you need expensive or fancy scientific equipment to do really great science. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do with our kids and what a lot of actual professional scientists use who are limited by budgets um, is kind of creative stuff with regular household materials. And so there's a, a, a huge amount of science you can do with um, pretty basic scientific equipment. Yeah, if you look through some of these pictures, you'll see kids with 
rulers, um, some basic nets. I mean, some, I think a few of the pictures even uh, have those homemade bug nets that we do. If you didn't catch that, you should hop on and find Mary Ellen's uh, video about how to make a bug net so things can be made at home. Um, how to make a quadrat or a transect. Again, you don't have to have, but basic household materials, you can uh, come up with a lot of uh, great projects. Do you want to talk about any of our snow programs? I've seen a few snow photos come up. Uh, we just finished, uh, thankfully, we snuck in a lot of snow programs this winter before things shut down. Yeah, all the all the snowy pictures that you see uh, in the slideshow are from some of our winter snow science programs. And these are pretty special because um, snow plays a really big role in the California ecosystem. A huge amount of our precipitation um, each year, actually 30% of all the water in California starts as snow at some point. So we have a bunch of groups who come from the Bay Area or Sacramento, places where there's not snow. Um, up to this Tahoe area to study the snowpack because it's a major source of water for all of them. Um, and there's a lot. Um, snow sometimes looks pretty homogenous and white, but there's a huge amount of science going on in snow. Um, and things change with depth and the crystals change and there's temperature and all sorts of moisture in there. Um, and plus being in snow is a, a pretty great experience. And we, um, my favorite ones are some of the scholarship groups that we get to work with, who many of the students have never seen snow before, even though it's a main source of the water that they drink out of their taps every day. And so it's neat to connect those two things together. Yeah, and I would say that um, all of our research that is done up here is somewhat related to snow um, because the plants and uh, animals and things that are growing here um, and the water projects that we do in the summer are all related to the amount of snowpack that we've had during the year. Yeah, it, um, yeah, even though many of the programs that we do, there isn't snow on the ground, um, it's still, like you said, very affected by the seasonality and the, the growth cycle that's kind of determined by the snow. Um, so it's... Uh, so yeah, here's a couple pictures you might have noticed of kids in their classroom presenting their research. Um, we always end with kids giving a public presentation. Uh, they get to practice their presentation skills and really um, think about how, what they want to tell other people about what they learned. Spencer's really good at working with students on getting them to pull together their ideas and make these presentations. The, the, the fun thing about all these presentations um, is they, they go best um, when it's the student's own words. And so I try really hard as an instructor not to tell them the right answer, but to ask the students the questions that will help them um, understand their material so that they can communicate it uh, back to their classmates and audience. And it's a, a really fun teaching challenge for me um, and uh, when you get a student to share a presentation like this um, with their own powerful voice is pretty special. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's amazing. Um, and the kids, you know, learn so much and have so much fun during their projects. I mean, I hopefully you guys are all noticing the smiles that uh, are happening out there. Um, I think that we try to make sure that the kids you know are doing their serious research but having a good time while they're doing it and um, that really shines through in their project presentations with how much uh, knowledge has stuck with them mm -hmm. um yeah and i think another great way it shines through as you can see we've got a lot of smiles in here um but we also do um, pre and post survey surveys before all of our programs we ask the students a bunch of questions about what they think about the sciences and how confident they feel, and then do it again at the end. Um, and we see some pretty great results between the beginning and end, just to kind of measure ourselves because we're scientists. We want to we want to know how we can improve, but also um, just to be able to show and um, that uh, these programs actually do not only do students do research and have a good time with it, they like science a lot more after going through this process. 
Yeah, that's Spencer's ongoing research project is uh, <laughs> how well uh, how well we are doing and the students are doing uh, during programs and what they're learning. Um, and I have to say, it feels really good at the end um, to see what the positive results uh, that we're, you know, positive impact we're making on all of these students. Yeah, um, there have been so many students that we've worked with who have said something, this is actually a quote, it's like, um, the people who know me know that, you know, science isn't really my thing, but after doing this, like, I think it might actually be okay. Um, <laughs> And being able to take a student who is um, kind of set maybe that they're not a scientist or that's not something that they could do to um, be able to open that door to them is, uh, yeah, it's very special and why I love to do the teaching I do. Yeah, it's, uh, that's an in incredible feeling. Um, you can see again from some of those pictures, we are able to make labs almost anywhere. Um, so. Uh, kids use testing kits. Um, we've used them on the side of the river, in the kitchen, at a house rental, um, all over. Um, so it doesn't, you don't need, um, here in the lodge at Clear Japan, you don't need a science lab. Uh, you do need to be careful in your own house that you don't uh, contaminate anything your parents don't want you to um, and that you're acting safely. But I would say there's a ton that, uh, you know, that you can do from home. Yeah, um, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. Um, you just need to set up something that you can do repeatedly and uh, that's science. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's great. And these kits are things that can easily be ordered or um, you know, we could send some basic, basic tools. You can see solo cups in a number of the pictures make uh, great, um, you know, great things to uh, measure out your samples in. We also reuse uh, recycled water bottles, Ziploc bags, um, all those things make great uh, sample collecting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, it doesn't, doesn't need to be complicated. Oh, we've got the girls camp here. Yeah, so we have a few programs we wanna highlight for just a minute before we bring on our board president, Andy, with his lesson for you at nine. Um, so for the past few summers, we have done this amazing girls science camp. Um, it's the highlight of my summer. Uh, we still haven't gotten a clear answer yet to whether we can host this at Weber Lake, but um, just because it's probably my favorite part of uh, teaching for Headwaters, I thought I'd share a little bit. Um, so here's some photos. This is at Weber Lake last summer. This is a group of girls um, at the end of our project. Uh, this is Carly. She's super into bugs um, and uh, she studied bugs as part of her, uh, her research project. Um, we were out at Weber Lake. We do this in partnership with the Truckee Donner Land Trust. Uh, there's our campsite with some kayaks and uh, we have tents around. We make our makeshift lab and research areas uh, around the camp. We make plenty of time for fun with swimming. We do, this is a service project where we were doing some trail building and maintenance. Um, and it is just an amazing week. Uh, that's Ashley Pierce, one of our uh, Headwaters instructors who's taking a little time in DC right now working for the NSF. Um, here's us having one of our group discussions around the campfire. You can see very serious. Uh, yeah, that's um, awesome serious lab situation. Um, here's uh, a few of the girls that did a project together. Um, we were heading out into the meadow to collect uh, some samples. Um, Weber Lake's great because there's forest and meadow out there, uh, beautiful wildflowers in the summer, and it's really possible to uh, collect a lot of uh, great data. There's a little break at Weber Falls for some fun using yeah. some quadrats out in the meadow. Um, like I said, the wildflowers are absolutely beautiful out there. Um, yeah, it's an incredible wetland out there that students get to go spend a, a week in and study. Yeah, Lacey Meadows is just gorgeous. Uh, and the lake itself as well. Um, so lots of opportunity for great, uh, great things to study. Yeah. Um, and I will be really sad if we can't all get back together uh, just 
it's a really good bonding experience. But I think the most important part is the girls come out with an amazing research project, which we'll be able to do with our um, new summer camp. Um, that's online. So the types of projects that they did and that experience, um, in fact, kids will be able to go into even more depth uh, this summer with the longer term research project. Definitely. It, um, it's a really cool, cool thing and has a, a really special, um, special feeling compared to a lot of our programs. I've only get to see the very tail end of some of the science presentations, um, but it's really, really a neat thing. So uh, I'm going to delay Andy by just one minute and let Spencer put in a quick plug for Met Sacramento High School and Barrett Middle School, who are two of our Sacramento area schools who are hoping to raise some money today. Yeah, exactly. So the Met Sacramento, it's a school we work with um, for years. We'll actually get to talk to their teacher, um, Chris Chu, at 2.30 today. But they often come up for a snow science program like we were talking about. Snow is really important to these students who live in the Central Valley because agriculture is such a big thing there. These photos are actually from two years where we had about 15 to 20 feet of snow on the ground that really kind of changed, uh, changed some of their perspectives on how much snow we could actually get. Um, so we had a lot of digging, but also a lot of neat science to see how does snow change with depth there. And then I think our next one is the Barrett Middle School. Their teacher is Lori Sindelwaro. She'll also join us at 2.30 for our panel of teachers. But we had a giant field day up here in the Van Norden Meadow um, this winter studying all sorts of things like this insect, a water boatman. Um, we had a really fun time with these students. We kind of canvassed the meadow and collected a lot of really neat data on all sorts of the the living things there. Um, and so we were really excited to have that. And that was probably one of our biggest and my most favorite field days from this past fall. So thanks Spencer for sharing with us. Um, I am going to say goodbye to Spencer for a little while and we're gonna bring in Andy Giordano, our, um, our board president. So thanks for sharing about programs and you'll be able to see Spencer a little later on. All right, bye everyone. All right, um, and I am going to um, go ahead and bring in Andy Giordano. He is, um, he is our board president at Headwaters Science Institute. Um, and Andy is going to give us a uh, lesson on photography. So just a little background, Andy and I went to graduate school together at Washington State University um, back a long time ago. I can't believe we're getting that old. Um, but um, in that time uh, that I was in grad school with Andy, he was an amazing partner, um, especially with uh, the more mathematical end of science. Um, we did some great problem sets together. Um, he is a great scientist, uh, teacher, and photographer. He's been the Headwaters board president for four years, and I'm just super thankful to have all of his advice and help and leadership. Um, he uh, he brings the perspective of being a, having been a scientist, um, having is a, currently a teacher, um, and I would say uh, the scientist hasn't really left him as we learned last week in his um, his talk with a scientist. So I'm super excited about his lesson on incorporating photography into science. I would love to try to do more of this myself. I actually, when Andy was first getting into photography, I was more into photography and have kind of drop back a little bit more in my life. And so I think this has been inspiring to me um, to be able to uh, maybe think about doing a little bit more of that again. Thanks, Great, Andy. thanks, Meg. Those mathematical genetics problem sets are steering <laughs> into my memory. There's no question about that. <laughs> Good times. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Meg was actually the first person who suggested that I trade up from a to a digital camera. We're talking uh, 15 years ago, 14 years ago now, um, when I would come back from adventures with like reams of, of film. And so the 24 shots in one roll would all be of the same thing. She was like, man, you, you really probably, it's time for you to just get a digital camera. And that was a big step for me along this journey. Um, 
So Meg, if you want to get my yeah. PowerPoint up there. I'll do that and I will pull myself out and turn it over to you. Thanks, uh, Andy, for uh, doing this for us today. Yeah, of course. I think a lot of people will learn a lot from your lesson. All right, I hope so. Um, so as Meg mentioned last Tuesday during our Lunch with a Scientist talk, um, I was asked a question in the post-talk uh, Q&A about uh, how to incorporate photography into uh, science activities and projects and just different ways to engage uh, young scientists or science students with their cameras. Um, so I decided I would just put together another talk on this topic. Um, pretty light, pretty fun. Um, we're gonna hit the relationship between science and photography from two different perspectives today. Uh, I wanna talk about using photography within your scientific pursuits and also something that's near and dear to my heart, which is using a scientific perspective in your photographic pursuits. So uh, the truth is that these two pursuits are extremely closely related, particularly um, in the art field of photography, the relationship between science and the product you create as an artist, uh, they're almost indistinguishable. Um, as you can see here on the, on the left side of the screen, uh, we have probably the most famous, oops, most famous scientific photograph ever taken, Photo 51, under the guidance of Rosalind Franklin in 1951, the photograph that gave Watson and Crick the final piece of evidence they needed to publish their paper on the double helical structure of DNA. Um, so that's photography used to strengthen a scientific argument, used as evidence in a scientific study. Whereas on the right, we can see um, a photograph of a scientific phenomenon, electrical fields discharged across um, across photographic glass uh, allows us to you know, generate art using sort of the fractal structures of electrical fields, of lightning fields, and mimic lightning on a small scale. Uh, so my suggestion and my advice throughout the talk today is gonna be to sort of use these two pursuits interchangeably. Consider, um, how you practice and explore photographically as well as scientifically. And at any point in time that you can use photography to strengthen your science or vice versa, um, the more you practice that, the, the more ingrained and simpler that procedure will feel and the better results you might find. Um, so as we consider photography's role, just as a little bit of background in science um, and scientific exploration, it's important for us to think about the aspects of the scientific method that are maybe have the most opportunity for the use of photography. Um, so I sort of pulled out the ideas of observation, um, hypothesis testing, reporting our scientific outcomes, and long-term science scientific monitoring as four really key places where you might engage in photographic pursuit while being a scientist. And I think the most obvious one of these is observation. So, you know, when it comes down to it, we are all trained observers. We're, we start observing the day we're born. And we're really looking out here for something in the natural world that excites us and maybe incites a question for us to take the next step in our scientific exploration. Photography is an excellent tool for strengthening our observational skills. Um, whether we're looking at physical data, uh, the boys in this picture are studying flow rates uh, in the in Prosser Creek, right around the corner from here in Truckee, California, um, where we are uh, making behavioral observations. Uh, one of the best uses of photography is, a, is this idea of seeing photographically, beginning to think about what your subject, how it interacts with the scene and how you interact with it in order to get a, an effective photograph, which when observing animals can be really, really powerful. Your powers of observation get heightened and might lead you to ask questions about their behavior um, or simply studying variation within organisms, trying to figure out which organism is different, how are they different, what variation is okay within the, within the system that you're studying, um, or perhaps the timing and nature of their response to seasonal changes in the environment. So once you've made those observations, hopefully they lead you to ask a question. And when asking a question in science, we're often trying to come up with a hypothesis. So what is that what is that um, potential explanation for the pattern that you're seeing? And our objective is to use the information we gathered from our from our observations or maybe from um, 
knowledge that we've accrued through our experience to make predictions and using photography to design an experiment that tests that hypothesis. And when it comes to experimental design, this is probably the part that people study struggle with the most is making sure that their test actually is valid. It actually defines and defends um, the hypothesis that you are seeking to explore. So one of the most famous hypotheses that I teach in biology um, is sort of on the back end of our natural selection studies. And when we talk about Darwin's um, pursuit of the pollinator for the uh, African spur orchid, star orchid, can't quite remember exactly which one it is, but an orchid with a 12 inch spur. Now Darwin understands, understood pollinator um, relationships with the plants. And he hypothesized that if this plant with a 12 inch spur existed, there must be a pollinator out there with a 12 inch proboscis. And uh, later on down the line, we found that African hawk moth that has a 12 inch proboscis that was capable of uh, pollinating that plant. So he's got a hypothesis and, it, and we're able to sort of verify that hypothesis. In this case, the hypothesis that you generate, uh, the things that you're looking at depend on what you're interested in, what sparks your um, sort of curiosity. Sci uh, photography is extremely useful in reporting. This is a little bit less about science and more about engagement. The idea that by having a series of excellent photographs of your field study, of your experimental design, of the, uh, your lab results, gives you an opportunity to engage the public. Um, scientific communication <laughs> is something that we, uh, as scientists, need to work on universally, whether we're excellent at it or um, we are still uh, developing in that way. The way in which we communicate our ideas is critical in order to uh, get engagement, get ears on our ideas. And that often requires us to uh, have really compelling photographs to tell that story. And also long-term monitoring, um, whether it's tracking humpback whales with their sort of unique fingerprint like tail prints uh, in order to see their migration patterns um, and, and just verify that they keep coming back to their their grounds year after year, or um, just last week, one of our students caught a massive, massive rainbow trout in the in the little Truckee River, and I sent the picture to uh, to one of our local guides, Matt Heron, who uh, immediately texted me back a picture of the exact same trout that a friend of ours had caught uh, a week earlier. Just knowing gives us some information about how far these fish move up and down river just because of the patterns of the spots on the fish are exactly the same. Um, on a larger scale, uh, Mona Lake is pictured here and we can sort of get a sense of the depth of the lake. And for, for decades now, um, they've used photographs to communicate with the public about the, the advance and recession of, of the water line in Mona Lake in order to sort of communicate to the public, hey, uh, depth of this of this lake is important. It's a unique ecosystem um, and how we manage it has an awful lot to do with our patterns of water use and photography is an excellent way to show us that as well as communicate to the public the importance of the system and, and how it changes over time depending on human patterns of water use. Um, so that's sort of like a framework for us to think within. Um, and the question, the original question was, what can I do? How can I incorporate photography into my studies? So I've got a few ideas here. We're gonna start really simple with some of the things that um, your elementary school students and middle school students, you guys might already be doing in your classes and sort of branch out, get a little broader, a little more self-directed as we go along. Um, so one of the things that a lot of students are doing right now is looking for signs of spring in their in their backyards or in the parks around their house. Um, and I think that seasonal change is a really fun thing to consider when taking photographs, whether it's simple exploration of the wildflowers that live in your neighborhood. Um, there are other expressions of spring, obviously. Uh, around here, we see various parasitic snow plants stop, start to crop up. You may have access to standing water or rivers and lakes where you might see amphibians that are starting to lay eggs. All these sort of 
things are great signs of spring that can help connect your younger student with nature and sort of get them excited about what's going on outside during change, um, during periods of change. Um, obviously, if you are looking for an experimental approach to using photography in this way, these images can be used to predict times, times of change, when do we think these flowers will bloom, how does the community of flowers change from year to year. Um, looking at uh, salamander eggs in this picture, we get to make predictions about when we think they're going to hatch and become larva. And there's a lot of different long-term sort of things we can do. Change is always fascinating. Some of the most popular subjects to photograph uh, around the nation are evidence of seasonal variation. Considering the timing of when leaves start to senesce in the fall is really uh, compelling and fun photographic exercise that we can engage in. Um, and both of these things, just getting outside, taking pictures, looking for, looking for evidence of change in our environment could lead us to generate maybe a backyard catalog um, where we're collecting images of interesting biota in our neighborhood, in the area around our home, and just start compiling them and get a sense of what that community looks like, what that ecosystem might look like. And good pictures of these subjects, you'll notice there's nothing like too, too hard to track down here. Um, good pictures of these subjects can then be brought home, laid out in a, a, a layout like this and used to uh, identify or key out the species that exist in your system. Uh, also, going on at least in our household right now and i'm sure many sort of kindergarten and elementary school households around the u.s uh, a lot of our kids are growing their own seeds this is a fairly standard curriculum um, and we can use photography <coughs> photography instead of drawing a flip book uh, drawing the sort of stages of change as our seeds grow for a flip book as our younger kids start to understand how plants grow um, how fast they grow, what kind of decisions they make, what they need to grow. Um, they can take a series of photographs every day and make a little time-lapse video. Obviously, parents, you'd have to help out with that. Or we could print them out and sort of make a flip book out of those pictures. Um, I guess a tip for this would be to just try to uh, try to get your, your child to hold the camera in the same position every time. I can testify that that is a bit of a challenge and sort of adds a layer of difficulty for those uh, supervising this activity. Um, slightly older students might be asking questions about uh, growth rates. And it's pretty easy to put a ruler, uh, like tape it onto the window right behind, right behind the plants as they're growing, make predictions about how tall they'll get, how, how much they grow every, every day, and sort of engage in a more predictive level with this kind of an activity. Um, as we sort of increase in complexity, we're lucky to live in this day and age where there's so much connectivity and so much sourcing of information in the world around us. Um, citizen science is long, long emerged as a great way to harness the power of the public to make more observations than one individual or one lab could possibly do. There are a lot of different citizen scientists projects that engage photographically with the environment for monitoring, studying emergence, looking for invasive species, understanding water quality. There's a list of a number of them here. I'd highlight Citizen Science Lake Tahoe, uh, the mobile app generated by Turk to focus on water quality and invasive species in the Lake Tahoe Basin. It's a really easy app to download for free, get registered and start collecting data when you're at the beach. Um, other options on here, that are really compelling for a young student include the iNaturalist app through which you can generate your own bio blitz or uh, inspire your teacher to do so in which you're sort of cataloging diversity throughout throughout your local ecosystem. There are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of these opportunities out there to, to use your phone to gather data in a compelling way and learn more about your ecosystem and contribute to real science that's going on nationally. Uh, this one is really flexible for all ages, depending on your level of engagement, just making your own pinhole camera. This might not seem like a scientific pursuit on the surface, but the reality is that um, 
it is a constant process of experimentation to get proficient with a pinhole camera and you don't need very much to do it. There are a lot of different directions out there on the internet. The link below is sort of the simplest, most ground level uh, set of directions for getting started. Any light tight box can act as a camera. So that part's really easy. You can use a box, you can use Pringles can, you can use uh, any sort of thing that you can close up uh, as a tube or a rectangle. Um, and all you do is get some photo sensitive paper like Polaroid film, tape it into the back of the box and uh, punch a little hole in the front. It's usually a good idea to use some tin foil or wax paper for that hole. Um, and then you can start experimenting right away and making experiments with exposure time, with the size of the pinhole, uh, with your subjects, how much movement you're gonna be able to pick up, all these kinds of things that turn this sort of uh, throwback activity that I did in seventh grade in my art class into a really thorough and thoughtful scientific experiment. Uh, one of my favorite things to do as a photographer is to study animal behavior. I sort of alluded to this before. Um, the opportunities that present themselves when you're in the woods with a camera to take photographs of animals in their natural habitat are really interesting. Um, and they also can provide you with insight into how they behave giving you the foundation to create hypotheses that you can use photography to um, explore. Um, these two images, both of birds in the field, uh, were both sort of provided me with an opportunity to think a little bit more, more deeply about the system that I was exploring at the time. Um, if we scroll down to the next shot, we've got two marmots here that are engaging in some dominance behavior, trying to figure out who's gonna be the king of the mountain. Um, these, are, these are just entry points, right? What is the question that can come from this? Uh, as we get more and more comfortable with the system, we start making predictions that can broaden our ability to get effective photos and also to design effective scientific experiments. As I said before, mon long-term monitoring is a key focus of using photography in science. Uh, we've all seen the pictures of changes in glacial coverage throughout the U.S. over the past um, 50 or 60 years. Um, if you don't have a glacier in your backyard to take photos of, uh, measuring change in any natural system is pretty simple using a camera. We just have to think about what it is, what subject it is that we might uh, be taking pictures of around here. A lot of questions that Meg and Spencer get and that I get through the course of teaching students is what's up with the lichen that grows on the trees? Is it, you know, is the old idea that it grows on the south side of the trees true? How come it doesn't grow all the way to the bottom? And these are really easy places for us to sort of go out, take measurements, use photographs as evidence, and start to test some of those questions. Does it have to do with snowpack? Does it have to do with access to sunlight for these plants to grow? Does it, what does it have to do with? These are all sort of questions we can answer photographically paired with scientific thought. Sort of the top shelf of um, scientific exploration is to design your own inquiry. Um, I'm gonna be pretty broad on this one because it's highly self-directed. You're gonna ask questions and pursue those questions according to your own curiosity. Um, these pelicans, I, I encountered in Santa Cruz a few years ago, really forced me to ask a couple of questions about animal behavior. Um, so as I see them flying around, as we often see with birds flying around, um, through the course of their migration, they seem to be highly in sync. They seem to be working together and questions might arise about how how deep does that go? How, how, hard, do, how hard do we think they work to behave, to be behaving in a similar fashion? Um, and as I, spent time watching the pelicans, it became clear that their, their synergy together, their teamwork was exceptional. It was really high level. Now, I think we all have this, you know, sort of understanding as we see a flock of geese flying in a bee formation over our head in the fall, coming back in the spring, that there's a high degree of coordination within a system. Um, but as I started to observe these pelicans, it was clear that that was just scratching the surface. We can see in this next picture, um, that even their foraging behavior is extremely coordinated um, as we see all of them sort of lifting their wings at the same time to dip their heads in. They're clearly working together as they uh, gather food out of this pond. And 
is an ideal place given the time and the curiosity to ask a question and use photography to sort of record data about the degree of coordination that these birds are engaged in. So on the other side of things, how we can use science to strengthen our art it largely comes down to being predictive. Now, photography, if you are a photographer, you've learned about the principles of reciprocity, yet the technical aspects of how we execute a photograph that matches our vision. We have a sense that the way in which we interpret a scene and use light and engage with our shutter speed, our ISO, and our, um, our uh, aperture provide us with the right amount of light to execute a photograph. Um, and as we get become more and more competent, more comfortable, stronger in mastering that craft, that stuff kind of moves into the background and gives us an opportunity to think about the natural world scientifically in order to generate art that, that we can do repeatedly by being predictive and engaging with the environment. So a uh, few ideas, things that I like to do, things that you might find interesting uh, that, are, that do require predictive nature and experimental nature. Um, the first one, and maybe the most obvious one, uh, my students certainly gravitate towards this right away, is to play with long exposure, to consider the amount of light in your scene, how long you can make your shutter in order to end up with the effect that you're looking for. This image uh, took five minutes to expose and required an awful lot of experimentation in order to get right, given the large amount of light that was on the screen or in the scene at the time. Isabel, I'm in the middle of a presentation, honey. Thank you. Um, predicting the weather is something we know that uh, is quite challenging. Um, but if we are paying attention to patterns, we understand our, our local uh, topography and, and system, we might have a better chance at uh, getting the results we want around here in the sort of the Donner Lake Basin. Uh, just outside of Lake Tahoe, just north of Lake Tahoe, we often get these in patterns of thermal inversion, which uh, stack clouds over Donner Lake, stretching up the mountainside. And if we have a firm understanding of how dew point works, how temperature works, how seasonal change works, um, we can start to predict the mornings when we're most likely to get this effect. Um, in the summer throughout the Sierra, we're often, I, I hate to complain and say we're plagued by bluebird skies. Most people love it. And I think I generally do too, but as a photographer, you, you want to know when the clouds are rolling in. What, when do you have a good shot at having a dynamic sky? Well, understanding the weather allows us to predict those kind of days where the temperature is just right, uh, the moisture is just right, that we might have a little bit of a summer squall blowing in, giving us the opportunity for a more dynamic image. Uh, fundamentally, the way that we compose an image is scientific in nature. I know it is, it is artistic as well, sort of the aesthetic choices that we make um, and the conclusions that we draw are often feel very artistic, but the way in which human beings interact with art, with an image it is neurological. So if we can understand how the elements of design can draw an individual's eyes towards our image and allow them to spend more time with it, that puts us in a really strong position um, as an artist to increase engagement with our work, whether it's the use of leading lines or compositional rules, um, we're able to sort of hold the viewer's attention for a longer period of time and start a conversation about that work. Fundamentally, photography is all about light. Um, light is obviously one of the major units in your physics class. So understanding how light interacts, uh, how it diffuses through clouds, what nature it takes when it's at a low angle as it's going down and coming up, how it behaves in the middle of the day, how it interacts with objects, increases our capacity to take photos uh, that use light effectively and therefore are, are a little bit stronger in their artistic sense. Um, one of my favorite things to do uh, as a photographer is to look for symmetry and look for natural patterns. Sometimes that symmetry takes place uh, as a reflection Sometimes it's engineered, like with these flowers. It's also really fun and rewarding to explore the natural patterns that we see in things like flower growth. A little bit more on the technical side, scientific, uh, scientific thought, technical execution is creating a composite 
Uh, this there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, this photo was taken by Etienne back in 1892. So this these. Uh, this style of showing motion has been around for a really long time. Um, nowadays, how we set up a composite of a human or an animal in motion, taking multiple exposures on our camera, if we're shooting digital, we're then taking that into Photoshop and, and blending all those images together to make our composite. Um, well, what we care about as a scientist is, is visualization, how, do we ask our model to behave in order to execute that? How far apart does our do our pictures have to be in order to get the, the spread between each individual that we're looking for? So that's a little bit more of a technical idea. Um, really hammered on this earlier, but understanding wildlife, wild animal behavior gives us a much better chance of taking effective photographs of animals in their native habitat. Um, just knowing when they're active, how they're active, how they behave with humans, um, what kind of uh, what kind of range that they're occupying, so get, all those things give us a much higher chance of getting an effective photograph of the organism that we're that we're thinking about taking a picture of. Uh, more abstract, a little bit more uh, subconscious, the idea that we can create paintings out of, or photos that look like paintings from nature, all of this within the camera. This is a process of experimentation, um, which is why I included in this talk as we talk about using scientific skills. You're never gonna nail this right off the bat. Um, the picture on the left is a tree stump and you can see that it's quite blurry. That's not done in post, that's done in camera with uh, just the simple action of zooming in and zooming out on the lens while the shutter's open. As you can imagine, it takes a lot of experimentation to get that get that effect just right. Um, on the right, we can see uh, a different effect, not done by zooming in the camera, uh, zooming in the lens, but done by panning the camera up and down the bark of the tree while while uh, clicking the shutter. So slightly longer shutter speeds on these, but it takes a lot of experimentation to get the image that you like. You may have to play around for an awful long time but that experimentation can be really rewarding if you're happy with the outcome. Okay, and, and lastly, maybe the easiest place to think about how our choices and understanding of natural patterns can create, allow us to create effective imagery is looking up, taking pictures of our astral bodies. So knowing when and where to, to look for uh, the Milky Way is really common. Astrophotography has become very, very popular over the past six or seven years. And this requires a high degree of prediction. We have to know what phase the moon is, looking for a new moon so that the stars are as bright as possible. We need to know what direction that Milky Way is with regard, um, not just to the compass point, but also to the foreground elements or the background elements you might want to include in the image. Um, and we need to think really hard about our our light triangles, we make decisions about how we want those stars to look. And of course, it doesn't just have to be stars. We can play around with all sorts of elements from uh, the moon to the way the, the sun uh, might hide itself behind certain elements in your composition. These are all really interesting ways to use a scientific er experimentation, scientific mindset to take effective photographs. So as I wrap up for today, um, I want to just suggest that whether you're a scientist or a photographer or trying to be both, it's important to be curious, to make predictions and to practice while you're exploring. All those things as uh, habits of mind are, are absolutely going to lead you to outcomes that you feel confident in. So thank you guys for listening. Um, Meg's gonna pop back in now and yeah. I'm gonna do some shout outs to a few of our donors. Yeah, just real quick, um, we did have a question come okay. in actually um, from Izzy about do you know where uh, the first seed plant in the world came from? Oh my God. That <laughs> seems like a question for you, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure on, on that uh, one. The first seed plant in the world. Well, I'm. It all depends on what you mean by a seed. Yeah. If we want to talk about the first sort of gymnosperms or first that gymnosperm is uh, means naked seed, then we're talking about conifers. So your pine trees and cycads 
and sort of evolving from ferns. Uh, this puts us, I think, and botanists out there, please don't crucify me because I don't know the dates, but I think we're talking about pre-carboniferous. So we're reaching back a really long way, something like uh, 220 million years, 250 million years ago for the, uh, the first seed plants. The kind of seeds that Izzy is talking about are probably things like apple trees. Uh, <laughs> so more like a gym, an angiosperm, a flowering plant. Those and, are a little newer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, since she planted, planted one of those a couple of days ago. Um, and there we're talking, again, dates are tough for me, uh, for the evolution of flowering plants. I think we're more on the order of like 120 million years ago for that one. Yeah, I'm uh, guessing that no one was... Uh, photographing the plants back then. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's all fossil evidence, right? Yeah. But we know what's most interesting about that evolutionary transition is that once plants evolve the ability to create flowers and fruit, we see this rapid adaptive radiation as they expand and start to dominate ecosystems and their ability to, to, to use the animals to help pollinate and also to eat the fruit and help them sort of disperse uh, around various ecosystems, allow them to really quickly adapt and become sort of the dominant species in our more temperate ecosystems, just of their ability to do more photosynthesis when the sun is up because they have broad leaves and also to spread um, and reproduce more quickly with the aid of their pollinators, uh, just gave them a real leg up in those temperate systems. Yeah, for sure. I was actually, as you were talking about that, I was thinking about how a cool photography project could be trying to take a picture of the pollinator and the plant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, some of those, uh, you know, things that just are have some synergy in nature. Um, I think that yeah. could be a cool photography project. Yeah, super cool. And, you know, we didn't get into camera traps or remote cameras. I wanted to sort of think about things that people could do with, with an iPhone or a regular camera. Um, but there, the world is, is if you can take pictures remotely, you can observe a lot of things that we don't get to see. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that was a awesome presentation, Andy. I really right. appreciate, uh, the great ideas. And I think that, um, for Headwaters, we're, we'll be looking at trying to incorporate some of these ideas into more of our programs. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so um, we should probably wrap up pretty soon, but I was hoping that we could uh, say some thank yous to some of the people who have donated during this last uh, hour or so while you were talking. Excellent. So um, I want to just take a minute to thank everybody for, for showing up and, and engaging with us at Headwaters on our big day of giving. This is a really important day for us that allows us to fund a lot of our programs um, and grow grow the fascinating content that that Meg and Spencer are generating and just uh, increase our reach and increase our impact uh, throughout the regions that we're active in. So every donation really makes a huge difference. Um, I want to thank the folks that were able to donate during that presentation. So um, thank you to Diane Giordano of Getsville, New York. Hi, mom, really appreciate the support. <laughs> you also to Nancy Wallace of Truckee, California, board member Erica Seifert, um, uh, and Chevy Chase. Is yeah, she right? moved for, out of DC and into the suburbs of Chevy oh, Chase, Maryland. Okay. Yeah. And Chevy Chase, in Mar uh, from Chevy Chase in Maryland. Uh, thank you so much to Ann and Andy Slucky out in Oakland, California, parents of a former student of mine, really interested in what we're doing. Thank you to Ashley Pierce in Washington, DC, uh, Diana Seifert in Salem, New Hampshire. Hi to Meg's mom. Uh, <laughs> thanks to board member Jack Holmes in Davis, California, and Alec Atkin, other, another board member in Granite Bay, California. Um, thank you also to Amy Atkin in Gran Granite Bay, California, and Leah Glason here in Tahoe City, California. Thanks so much for donating during this period, guys. We really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, we're excited. We have our $10,000 match today. So it's a great day to donate because your donation will be doubled. Um, you can get on at the bigdayofgiving.org backslash Headwaters Science Institute and, uh, you know, donate today to support this. Um, our online videos are reaching a ton of kids. I, I don't know that I actually had a chance to tell Andy, but last week we reached about 5,000 people through mm -hmm. our 
yeah, through our so online Don't videos. tell me that stuff before I go. Tell me <laughs> that yeah, um, actually that week that with your, uh, last week with your scientist talk, um, things just really took off. We had some more people share and more teachers that were able to get it out to their students. And, um, That's you know, great. we moved from numbers around 1,000 to about 2,000 the week before, and we had a big jump to almost 5,000 last week, so. Well, that's excellent. And so, any viewers out there who are experiencing this content, especially right now and looking for inspiration about whether it's the science talk from last Tuesday, the photo talk from today, uh, looking for ways to enact anything that I'm talking about or for tips on it, um, you can get in contact with me. My contact information is on the Headwaters uh, website. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And I think uh, if you're ready to, we can sign out until yeah. a little bit later today, uh, this afternoon, um, Spencer and some teachers, and I think Erica is hopping, one of our board members is hopping on. Um, so go ahead and uh, you can donate in that time. You can get your extra points for trivia. Um, I know Andy is really great at trivia and <laughs> Craig, will be, uh, <laughs> Craig will be on during our happy hour doing that. So uh, he's um, really great at trivia, at hosting trivia. Yeah. And so with every donation, you uh, you get extra five points towards your trivia. And we have some great prizes from um, Trip Tarp and Belle V, as well as some Headwaters prizes. So Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Meg. And thanks, yeah, everybody, thanks. for uh, tuning in. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. And thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you later today.